Hello and welcome to the Sunday Shale Show. My name is Mike Chadzi and today I'm joined by Chris Gruth from the U.S. Stream of Commerce. Chris, how are you today? Very well, Mike. Thanks for having me here. Well, absolutely. Thanks for being here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your role at the Chamber. Um, absolutely. Uh, I'm largely a policy wonk. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time um, working in Capitol Hill for several congressmen. Um, as well as working in the Department of Energy, and now I'm working at the, uh, the Chamber. And uh, the Chamber is the largest trade association in the country. Um, we represent uh, every sector of the economy, every region of the country, um, big and small um, companies. And uh, I work within a part of the Chamber called the Institute for 21st Century Energy. And uh, we really focus on trying to find uh, energy policy to unite both policymakers and the business community and Americans at large. Um, along the lines of policy that secures our energy future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm here in Ohio today um, specifically because of uh, unconventional oil and gas development and uh, the profound impact it has on our energy security. And we've launched a, a campaign, um, Shale Works for Us, uh, in the summer. And um, it's largely focused on um, explaining the, the broader business benefits that unconventional oil and gas um, is providing and will provide. Um, I think it's, it's well understood by most, or certainly assumed, that the, the oil and gas industry benefits from this. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps not as, as much as it wants sometimes, um, depending upon the price of gas, the price of oil. But a lot of people, especially in new areas like Ohio and, and even parts of Pennsylvania still, um, don't necessarily see the direct benefit that um, folks who aren't necessarily related or, or working in the oil and gas industry um, benefit from. Sure. And so we, we've spent a lot of time working through the state and local chambers and, and, and other friends in the, in, the, in the region, in the Marcellus and Utica region, trying to find good examples of those businesses to help put faces to the numbers. And then to, to marry those faces with actual data. And to that extent, we've um, spent a lot of time over the last few months um, working with some other national partners um, uh, to put out a study, the first study that, that creates a quantification of the impacts of, of unconventional oil and gas development in the country. Um, and then in, in December, we released a state-by-state -state study that, that shows um, precisely what is happening in Ohio and, frankly, every other state. Um, and, and really, the, the results are, are astounding. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. When, what, if, when you look at the national study and then the Ohio study, did you see certain things happening in certain areas? Was it happening across the board? Or is there something specific happening in Ohio? I mean, I, you know we're early in the play here, yeah. the Utica play, <clears throat> but are there trends or things that are starting to happen here that you can see in other places? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's several takeaways. Um, first and foremost, the national study showed that in, in 2012, about 1.75 million jobs um, were supported solely from the, the unconventional oil and gas industry. Um, given how that has developed very recently, mm -hmm. it's a fair assumption to say that the vast majority of those jobs were created in the last four years. Makes sense, um, yeah. Happens to coincide with one of the worst economic you know, recessions this country has ever had. Um, high, prolonged high unemployment. So, but for those 1.75 million jobs, it's the back of the envelope calculation uh, very fair to assume that we would have seen national unemployment well in excess of 11%. Um, but it's not just jobs. It's at this point, IHS, the, the folks who did the study for us, estimate that uh, unconventional oil and gas provides about 2% of our GDP. 2%? Um, 2%. Wow. I mean, the number 2% seems small, but when you think about the entire economy, in the country, it's this, big. this isn't even just all oil and gas, it's just one part of oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also, uh, it, created, it generated about $86 billion, $82 to $86 billion in, in government revenue, both at the state and the federal level, about half of that went to the states. Um, if you look at sort of the Ohio side and go state by state, we see tremendous benefit already. I mean, at this point, we're looking at about 39,000 jobs supported um, by unconventional oil and gas shale development. Um, I think that's important to, to make a distinction here is, as you mentioned, the Utica is still in a very early phase. Have I mean, 50 wells producing here in Ohio. Exactly. I mean, that's, you know, slowly but surely. Just over 200 drilled. And I make that point only to say that of those 39,000 jobs, only a small sliver are actually going into actual exploration and production in Ohio. The vast majority of those jobs are supporting the long supply chain into other states. And that's one of the things we saw is even states that aren't producing, states like New York who've decided to put a moratorium in place, they're still benefiting because the, the supply chain is so long. I mean, we work with, with companies throughout throughout Ohio. I mean, one of, one of our partners, um, VEC Oil and Gas Services, uh, they do engineering service for oil and gas companies and they have been servicing the companies in, in North Dakota. And oh, that's huge. they had, wow. you know, you hear a lot of talk about, you know, 
folks from other states coming into Ohio, and this is a case where you had Ohioans going to other states, and now they have the opportunity to really help out um, in the, the exploration and production in this state. And so our study also goes out in the future. And so we see this 39,000 jobs you know, ballooning to over 140,000 jobs in 2020. And that's where you see the exponential increase in those direct jobs in the oil fields. Um, but you certainly see you know, well beyond just the oil fields. I mean, we have a, another, a, another friend um, in New Philadelphia at the, the New Philadelphia Inn. I mean, it's you know, a sort of a mom and pop operation that, that has had problems um, keeping uh, rental rates or um, customers flowing occupancy, through. Occupancy, occupancy yeah. excuse me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, but this, this, all of a sudden, this influx of workers needing places to stay has enabled them to hire more people and frankly keep the business open. So it's, it's a lot more than just what people think about mm -hmm. by way of oil and gas, um, That's good. oil and gas companies. And then, then ultimately, I mean, this is about America's energy security. Correct. I mean, we've all, no matter how old you are, whether you're five or whether you're 95, have been you know, taught um, through school and through, through popular culture that America is energy poor, that you know, we are, are gluttons for energy and we will consume it and consume it, but we don't produce it. Um, to some extent, that was true at certain points in the past, but the reality is that that's no longer the case. I mean, we have more oil, we have natural gas and coal than any other country um, in the world. And it's important for us, and specifically for our government, at the federal level as well as the state level, to have policies that, that address that. They don't, uh, that aren't geared towards energy scarcity, but are geared towards uh, efficiently and productively using the energy resources we have I mean, you know, we've consistently been importers of natural gas and certainly oil. Um, we're now at a point where we can export natural gas, and we're very near a point where we may very well be able to export oil. It just comes down to a question of whether or not the federal government stands in the way. Absolutely. Well, talking a little bit about the focus here in Ohio, obviously the U.S. Chamber. Now there's a partnership or a natural role with the Ohio Chamber, the U.S. Chamber. What, what kind of dynamic do you folks have there? And how do you push these messages forward and try to communicate not only the general public, but elected officials and perhaps even the media, what's happening and, and what to maybe expect on the road? What, tell me a little bit about that relationship. Well, I mean, each of the chambers, whether it's the, the Cuyahoga County Chamber or Greater Cleveland Partnership, or the uh, the Ohio um, the Ohio State Chamber, they're all independent. So I mean, we don't get to tell them what you know, they do or what they believe. So it's important that we have a um, a back and forth relationship, a symbiotic relationship, and we trust each other quite a bit. And that's that's really the U.S. Chamber's strength. How we can utilize those those thousands of chambers throughout the country and the partnerships that we have with them um, to present that broader message. And more importantly, come back to Washington with some credibility. I mean, we have real businesses out there, real chambers that members of Congress know and have to work with every day. And so when we bring that message to bear, um, it has a lot more credibility behind it because of our relationships with them. And in, in, in Ohio, it's a perfect example. I mean, as the Utica gets built out, I mean, they're helping us find success stories, and we're using those success stories to weave together a national narrative that we can use at the federal level so that federal regulators and federal legislators in Congress understand how important this is and to, to understand the, the, the potential benefits going into the future and, and, and frankly not be nearsighted in, in their federal policies. Well, it makes a lot of sense. So what's so interesting about that is not only can the U.S. Chamber send information, hey, here's a study we did, here's the matrix, here's the facts, but then local chambers, state chambers say, well, by the way, here's Tom, Dick, and Harry, yep. here's their business. I mean, the free flow of information, you're going to get these exact success stories, but you're able to provide those local chambers, those state chambers, that specific data from that national perspective. That's what's so interesting about that particular story. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we have one more study coming out in the next few months that's going to really um, look at the downstream, the, the, the manufacturing, the petrochemical side of things. And uh, as you move into other areas of Ohio that aren't necessarily on top of the Utica Check and, and two, seeing the impacts of, of exploration and production, um, they're going to benefit on the manufacturing and the Check petrochemical two. side. I mean, Cleveland's a perfect example. Exactly. I mean, there's a tremendous petrochemical industry here. And uh, we look to you know find the, the potential Check success one, stories. Two. They haven't realized Check it yet. One, two, but as the infrastructure gets built out, as production Check comes two. online, bringing that natural gas up into the, the Cuyahoga area, um, that's going to be a huge Check boom for one, that, two. Two, that sector. Check. And it, all of a sudden now you're talking about a whole different uh, part of the economy that you know heretofore really hasn't been talked about yet because that's a that's a tremendous value added, but it's.
take some time. To it's what happens out. next. If exactly. You, I mean, that's when you have, you know, 500 permits issued in Ohio, 200 approximately that have been drilled, and then 50 that are producing. So you have to get those things online. You have to get that product ready to take to market yep. in order to build that pipeline infrastructure, that transportation infrastructure. Well, Chris, as we wrap up here, is there any other final comments about maybe the Chamber's role, not only here in Ohio, but across the country, what you see happening with this industry moving forward, maybe taking the next <coughs> five or ten years. Where are we going and how do we get there? Well, I guess the only thing I would say, and it's certainly pertinent in Ohio, is uh, we know the resources here, but we also know the resources in Kansas. We know the resources in North Dakota. We know the resources in Illinois. And so it's not a lock that this resource has to be developed. I mean, the regulatory environment and the fiscal environment need to be such that it, it, it's conducive to industry wanting to invest the billions of dollars necessary to bring this resource online. And so I would caution Ohioans to take that into account. And it, it's, not, it's not a foregone conclusion that this resource we know is here is going to get produced. And you need to be very circumspect in the policies that you put forth. That makes sense. Well, not only in your tax code, make sure that it's common sense and it's uniform and it doesn't change all the time. But just like you said, the regulatory code, the business code, you want to be business friendly. But as you mentioned a little bit ago, it is really about balancing everything that we have already in Ohio. This is just one of a great example of opportunities we have, but it's very important to make sure we get it done right. So, well, Chris, thanks for joining us today. And if you need any more information, visit us at eidohio.org. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.